Man, didn't y'all, weren't y'all blessed by worship this morning? God is so awesome. Man, we're good to be back. I guess we were all gone last week. Were y'all here? You got to report on some of you. Don't lie to me. Hey, we were blessed. We, were, we went to, I'm sure they told you, go to one of our sister churches in Albany. And, you know, it's kind of like us getting to go encourage somebody else, you know. They're over there in Albany fighting a good fight and doing some great things and just going and being a part of that and encouraging them and, and what the Lord's calling them to run their race. And, and um, so anyway, we're glad to be with you in the house of the Lord this morning. High five somebody and tell them you're glad to be here. Uh, about half of you, 40% of you is a bunch of fuddy-duddy, I mean, it's all right. Acts chapter 10, I'm going to get going this morning, going to read one verse there in verse 34, and then we're going to spend most of our time kind of in, in another place. First Samuel, we're talking about Samuel. Acts 10, 34, it says this, this is Peter speaking. It says, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us, God. We thank you, God, that you're a God that loves everybody. God, that you don't set one apart and leave somebody else out. God, that you offer it to all of us. And so, Lord, I just pray that no matter where we're at in our journey today, God, you would make yourself real and alive and you would speak in a way that we can hear you. Lord, we love you. We need you. Help us to be changed by your presence today, God. Meet needs in this place. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So this, this, this passage, Peter, he was a guy that, like some of us, we, we hear about all the great feats that Peter did, mighty man of faith, strong guy, out front, but Peter, like some of us, he had it in his own mind how things were going to be sometimes, right? And Peter had just had this revelation from God that reminded him, that showed him that God's grace and his mercy is for everyone. It's not just for the goody two-shoes, you know, it's not just for the ones in church, but God's offering it to everybody, and he had showed this to Peter through a vision, then he takes him to a people that Peter wouldn't have went to, and he, he, he saved all of them and filled them all with the Holy Spirit, and like Peter's like, okay, I get it now, Lord. And you know, this, this summer we've been, we've been talking about sharing stories of the demonstration, hopefully, of God's power, and how awesome he is, and to remind all of us that, that God can do anything. And we need to understand what Hebrews 13, 8, when it says Jesus Christ, the Lord, is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. In other words, if he did it for some of these stories we read back then, if he did it for them, he wants to do it today. He's the same God. He can do the same thing. He can reach in the same ways. And we've been talking about all these stories, and it's understanding, hopefully, that God can really do anything in understanding this, that God works through people somebody say God works through people see all the time I think sometimes we're just expecting a lightning bolt to come down God's just going to send a whole herd of angels and his little uh, holy white doves and he can do that don't get me wrong because he he can but I'm going to tell you that what God does usually is he works through people and he's waiting for some people to say you know what I know what you've done for me and I believe you God and, and I think you can still do that through me and I'm willing anybody with me because sometimes in church, we can believe God for this amazing grace to save us. Okay, God, I believe that you can save me, but I don't, you know, I don't really hear how you could work through me. I don't really see what you could do in my situation, you know, because I've messed up. My family's jacked up, and, you know, and we got all this stuff. And, and I think you could do it for some of these other people, but I just don't think you could do it through and for me. You could just save me. And so we question, well, I hear some of this stuff, and I hear about God. I know he can save, but, but can he, does he really work in our life? Does he really change lives when I hear you talk about changing a family, changing the situation, changing this? Does he really do that? And we question when things don't happen real quickly. Anybody? We question when it's not on my timing. You're like, okay, I'm coming to church. And so we come to church, and we walk down here, and it's awkward, and people try to shake my hand, hug my neck. I'm like, but I'm going to give it a shot, you know. You've been wearing me out on this, so I'm going to come. And so we come once or twice, and, and then nothing happens, right? 
Nothing happens, and so all of a sudden, I begin to shrink back, you know. I begin to think, well, see, I knew that was all a bunch of hoopla, you know. It's just a bunch of mind stuff. And we begin to weaken a little bit. And I'm just going to tell you that God moves in an instant. He moves in a moment. When we accept him, everything shifts eternally. Everything changes. But sometimes it doesn't happen immediately. Because I want to tell you today that a lot of stuff, what God does, he can do a miracle like this. He can change everything in an instant. But sometimes, and usually as we grow up in the Lord, we're going to find out that when God does stuff on a big scale, when he does stuff touching eternity, can I tell you, it takes a process. Can I tell you, when we start thinking about changing the direction of a family lineage, it takes a generation or two. It takes a, a group of people that decide, you know what, it may not all happen right now, but for my kids it's going to be different can I get a witness and for my grandkids they're going to grow up knowing the Lord it's going to be a little bit different it takes a little bit of a process and we don't like the process we want it now we live in this culture where we get it and if it don't go in the microwave and it's not ready in three to five minutes I'm out Jack I'm going to also so huh? come on somebody we're going to get a chimichanga that's been finding its way in sermons the last few weeks. I don't know. We're just going to have a chimichang buffet here next week, maybe. <laughs> I had to use that at Albany last week because they ain't got a Walmart. All they got is an offsets over there. But that's the way we are, and we do the same thing with God if we think about it. We come to the Lord. We think, and we're trying to believe for a minute, but then it doesn't happen this week, and it doesn't happen next week. And I get impatient, and I get, I get downtrodden, and I think, well, what's the point, you know? And the enemy lies to us. And so we check in and out of the process. We come for a little bit, we get tapped in, then we pull back, and we check out, and we get distracted, and then we come back, we check in, we do it. You know what, anybody? And what we're doing is we're limiting God's ability to work in and through us at the potential he wants to. And so I just want to real, us to realize that God is not only epic in power, but, but on our part. Let's consider and let's try to learn a little bit. Are there some things that I can do or I can practice that might induce God or, or, or create an atmosphere where he could better readily move in my life the way he wants to? So we're going to look at David, mighty man of God. Most everybody knows about David, because how many of you know God gives us examples that we can learn from? God places people in your life for you to learn from. God gives us people in the Scripture. Obviously, he sent his son, but we're going to look at David a little bit, and let's just consider over these next two weeks, this is not everything because there's so much, but these are, we're just going to look at a few things, a few points today, a few points next week, and consider, did David have some attributes? What was different about David? Did he, did he have some stuff going on that allowed God to move in his life more easily, more readily? I mean, was there anything we could learn from? So we're going to look at three points today. Somebody say just three. Real simple, but I hope they're applicable and applicable to our life. Number one is this. We already heard this today. David was chosen. Somebody say chosen. See, if we read the story when David was called in 1 Samuel chapter 16, God sends Samuel to the house of Jesse. And he says, there's a new man that I'm going to anoint as king. And so Samuel goes to the house of Jesse, and he gets there, and the first son comes out, and he's buff, man. He looks a lot like me, good-looking rascal. Got it going on, right? Come on. And he comes walking out. And God says, this ain't him. You're messed up because God doesn't look at the outside like man, but God looks at the heart. So he brings the next one. The next one comes. So that's not him. Right on down the line through seven sons, it's none of them. Sam was like, what's the deal? And in verse 11, he says, are, are these all your boys? Are these all your kids? And he said, well, there's this one more, you know, the youngest said he's out tending to the sheep and Samuel says you got to get him because we're not sitting down till this is done you got to get him and so David gets shows up and it says he was ruddy good looking guy and it says the Lord said rise anoint this one anoint this one, for he is the one so Samuel takes the horn of oil he anoints him dedicates him to the Lord places his hand upon him and it says that the spirit of God 
came mightily upon David, and from that day forward, he was with him. See, understand this. It's like the song we sang a while ago. We have to understand that we're chosen. And some of us battle this, and I did. We fight it because we don't really know who we are. And I'm just going to tell you that this has nothing to do with humility. That's a different message. Humility is crucial. But this is not having to do with humility because none of us deserve this. Not one of us. Not the most righteous man or woman you know. We none of us deserve it, but we're chosen through Jesus Christ. Now we could say, well, you just said that he went through seven brothers and David was only one, so how can you say that I'm chosen? I'm telling you that because when Jesus came, he sent because we all need to understand that we're chosen. It's not just an elite. It's not just a select few. It's not just a certain ones in a certain family or a certain tribe, but we're all chosen. And we need to understand this, that beyond salvation, because we've already said that most of us can believe in God for salvation, but it's more than that. God has a purpose for our lives. Now, sometimes we don't like our purpose or we don't understand or embrace it, but we need to acknowledge that God chooses us not only for salvation, but he chooses us for a great purpose because God can do anything and he can use anything or anybody to bring glory to his name. And that's what we're called to do. We're not called to be superior. We're not called to be the most gifted. We're not called to be the best looking. We are called to be a people that brings glory to God's name. Amen? That's it. That's what we're chosen to do. The purpose that he has for us. He wants to save you. But he wants his light to shine through you. He wants to use you to make himself known to your family and friends. That's what he told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5. He says, before I formed you. Before you knew who I was, man, I had already set you apart. I had chosen you. And maybe Jeremiah had forgot it in 29.11, the famous one that most people know. And he reminds him, he says, for I know the plans that I have for you. I know what I've got for you to prosper you and not harm you and use you to glorify my name. Never forget that I'm chosen. Somebody say, I'm chosen. Tell your neighbor you are chosen. Because somebody, some of us are saying it and we don't believe it for ourselves. So we need to tell somebody else. We need to tell each other you're chosen. We know God saves us, but do you understand how much he loves us? In John 1, 14, we see him in a personal way. This God from heaven who was perfect and holy, and he comes down from heaven, and he takes off his, his, his royal garments, and he comes in this earth and walks as a man, walks like we do in the filth. And it says that the word of God became flesh and dwelled among us. He wanted to be with us. He wanted us to know how much he cared for us. And at the end of all of it, we see what they did to him. The creator and savior of the world allowed himself to be hung upon a cross. It wasn't just so that it would be a good story. It was because there was a debt. There was a trespass that none of us could cross over. And none of us could make it right. And so Jesus came and he took your place. He hung on the cross for you. Have you ever looked on and we look at the cross and maybe we see Jesus and maybe we see the blood but let me ask you this have you ever saw you on the cross because that's why he was there because he loved you this much he wanted you to know that personally he saved you personally you're chosen in our culture there's so many everywhere and we're looking for our place and we're looking where I'm supposed to fit we're looking for what I'm supposed to do and we don't understand that first and foremost our purpose and where we're supposed to be is to be a child of God. Our greatest identity, and this is why we struggle in an identity crisis, not knowing who we are, because our identity is found in Christ Jesus. It's not in our job. It's not in our money. It's not in our title, our position, our possessions, our status, our accomplishments. That's none of our identity. That's a facade that we put up on billboards of our life for the world to see. But our identity is only going to be found in Christ. This is the only thing that's going to fulfill me. How many of you has ever got a raise in here? I know somebody's gotten a raise. At least one of you. We're not all broke down that bad, right? But the thing about it is we've got a raise, and guess what? That didn't fix my life, did it? That didn't complete me. 
That didn't make everything just gravy because that's not our identity. That's not what's going to fix it all. You see, some people, we say, man, if I could just get out of here, if I could just move, if I could just get a different job, if I could just get a better status, you know, I'd be good. But the problem is that if we don't know who we are in Christ, we can move and we can change and we can get a raise. But the only thing, if we don't know our identities in Christ, we're just going to be in a different place around different people and be the same person. We have to know who we are. David knew who he was in the Lord and so many, I've been there. We don't know who we are and we're trying to find it and we're trying to be it. And we're trying to identify in the world and none of it matters until we know that we're forgiven and we're empowered to be children of God. Everywhere I'm at, doesn't matter what I'm doing, man. I may not like it, but I'm just, I know in this moment I'm a child of God. When I'm going through struggles with my family, I know that I'm doing it as a child of God. When I'm on the mountaintop and I'm winning the ball game, I'm doing it as a child of God. When I'm dealing with whatever I'm dealing with, I'm doing it as a child of God. Knowing who I am. David knew that he was a child of God. He knew that he was chosen. Number two, somebody say number two. David was obedient. Somebody say obedient. Everywhere David was, he was just obedient. We see it from a very young age. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, the passage that we talked about when the prophet Samuel shows up. He goes through the seven boys. Now think about it with me. This is a big deal. Back in that day, if you just had a visitor, man, you shut down. You took the day off. You served them. You prepared them, man. You fixed the meal. Let alone the prophet of God shows up. And so they're here, and they know he's here, and everybody's there, and all the family's there, and all the servants are there, and everybody's there. But where's David? It says that he's tending the sheep because he's obedient. And even though the superstar prophet was there, there was still a job to do, and somebody had to do it. Because if you know anything about agriculture, and I know that some of us do, you can't just take up and leave. And there may be a thing going on, but I'm telling you that somebody's got to check the cows, and somebody's got to check the water, and there's stuff that has to be tended to. And so David was obedient because he was told that you're going to go take care of the sheep. And so David, at a young age, before we even see his calling with God, he's learning how to be obedient. He's out there, and the Lord then calls him in. And I'm just saying this. You say, well, that's silly. That's no big deal. But I'm telling you that if we're not obedient in the small things, we're not going to be obedient in the big things. See, we do this with the Lord, and there's so many times there's stuff going on, and somebody needs to do it, and we miss it. We don't show up, and we don't tend to what we're supposed to do. But we say, but if it's something big, you know, I'll be there. If it's something big, I'll do it. If it's something big in the family, I'll no, we're not going to do it because we've practiced, and we've created a habit, and we're not obedient in doing these small things we ought to be doing. You can check your children. If our, we don't teach our children how to be obedient when they're little, they're not going to be obedient when they become adults because they just don't have it in them. He was learning to be obedient in the little things. Later in 1 Samuel 17, his dad said, hey, I want you to go check your brothers. They're in the army, right? Go check them in battle. Take them some food. Take some stuff to the king. And he says, find out what's going on and bring me back a report. It says David gets up and he goes. Goes to check on his brothers, goes to take them food. Even though they tried to push him away, he checks on them. He finds out what's going on, what in the world's happening here. You know what? Sometimes we want to make it happen. You ever want to make something happen? We're going to make this thing happen. And you know what? It's good to be active. And sometimes uh, swinging a bat at something's better than just standing there doing nothing. But sometimes we have this attitude about, I'm going to make it happen. And I'll tell you, that none of us can make it happen. Only God can make it happen. But what we can do to be used by God is be obedient to what God's telling us to do. I've had people through the years have conversations, say, man, I want to be used by God. How do I do it? How do I get there? How do I know what I'm supposed to do? And all I can tell you is this. Seek God. Get connected to some of God's people and be obedient to what God says. This is my story. Be obedient. 
Not saying I've been perfect, but I'm just saying everything that I've done is just because I was trying to do what I thought God was asking me to do. And when we do that, this is the key to God opening doors in our life. When we're obedient. It's not about us trying to do it. It's just about us obeying what God says. Many people talk about how much they know, and they tell you what everything that they've done. But here's the question, but are they being obedient? But are we doing what God says? Or are we just doing what we want to do and calling it a sacrifice and expecting everybody to acknowledge it? You see, there's a difference between sacrifice and obedience. It, in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, when he tells King Saul at the time, it cost him the kingdom that he was the king over. He says, man, obedience is better than sacrifice. Somebody say, obedience is better. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You see, King Saul sacrificed. He made a sacrificial offering to the Lord, but he didn't do what God told him to do. He did it his way. And we have to be careful that simply we need to be obedient. Because I'm telling you that I believe this. We're never going to become and we're never going to operate in our fullest potential without obedience. We can go through the motions. We can show up. We can do stuff. We can know some stuff. But I'm telling you that if we're not being obedient to what God's telling us, we're just playing church. You ever heard that term, playing church? And we're calling coming to church a sacrifice. And we're calling spending time with the Lord in our own time and telling everybody about it a sacrifice. And God says, I want your obedience. I want you to do what I'm asking you to do. Number three, David was courageous. Somebody say courageous. We all know the story of Goliath in church. People that hadn't come to church. We've heard about David and Goliath. We got to this point a while ago in 1 Samuel 17, but when David gets there, he finds out what's going on, and they're lined up in battle array. They're lined up to fight, and then the, this giant Goliath talks trash to them, and so they're all scared to death. And he finds out that this has been going on for 40 days. And that's when David asks them in verse 26, he says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? In other words, what David is saying is, what in the world is wrong with y'all? What are you doing? You are the sons of Israel. You are carrying the name of God Most High, and you're letting this knucklehead come out here and talk trash to you and disgrace you and dishonor God? Who is this guy that you're all afraid of? Nobody's going to do anything, and that's when David said, I'll go fight him. As a young boy, if you're not going to do nothing, then I'm going to step out there. I'm going to do it. Of course, they did what the world to do to us when we start walking obedient to God. They try to talk him out of it. And verse 33 said, you can't do it. You're just a kid, man. You're not able. You can't fight. This guy's trained. What was David's response? Courageously, he said, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I am just a kid. And maybe I am overmatched, but I'm going to tell you this, I'm chosen. Somebody say, I'm chosen. He said, I've been obedient. Somebody say, obedient. And I'm courageous. He said, you've got to understand, I'm not, David didn't just make this, this, this decision in an emotional moment. He'd been practicing being courageous. He tells a story in verse 34 through 37 of 1 Samuel 17. He says, listen to me. He says, I've been out there tending the sheep. But I hadn't been out there just sitting out there sucking my thumb. I've been out there tending to them. And when a lion would come or a bear would come and they would take my sheep and they would begin to take off with it, he said, I'd run them down. I would run them down and I would take back the sheep. I would take back what the enemy stole and then I would kill and destroy the lion or the bear. And he said, let me tell you something. The same God that delivered me from the Paul the lion and the Paul the bear is the same God that's going to deliver me today. I'm not better than anybody else. I'm not special, but I am courageous in what, Lord, what the Lord can do. But I want to tell you something as we wind this down. That being courageous isn't just about beating a giant. It isn't about being the hero and beating our chest. And waving at the crowd that's watching. You see, being courageous is honoring your spouse when it's easy not to. 
You see, being courageous is honoring the Lord when nobody's watching. You see, being courageous is following God when others aren't. Be, being courageous is teaching your kids to know and serve the Lord. Being courageous for some of us is, is saying no to an addiction that we've had, but we know that it's killing us and we know that it's stealing from us and it's being courageous enough to turn away from it and turn to God. Being courageous is sometimes about giving up stuff that's keeping me back. There was a man named Elisha, one of my favorite stories. Elisha was the prophet that Elijah chose. He was courageous. And the way it began in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah was looking for someone to disciple, someone to pass down what God had done in him. And it says he's walking by, and Elisha was a farm boy. And he was out there in the field with his oxen, and he was plowing out there, right? And Elijah comes by, and it says his robe touched him. And what happened was the anointing and the calling of the Lord fell off of Elijah, and it fell on Elisha. And when it touched him, he stopped. He said, I hear God. I sense the presence of God. And he tells Elijah, long story short, he says, I want to follow you. But right now, i got to take care of something first. And it took his oxen, and he took all of his equipment, and he took it, and he put it in a pile, and he set it on fire, and he burned it. He was courageous to get rid of some stuff that would keep him from following God. And I'm just telling you that at some point in our journey with the Lord, we're going to have to be courageous enough that if we really want to shine and we really want to see God move in our lives, then we're going to have to be courageous enough to get rid of some stuff in our life that's holding us back and keeping us from following God. Are you with me today? The bottom line is this. There's three things today that we talked about that help release the epic power of God in our lives. And we can embrace them today and then we can leave them here or we can consider them. Because not only will they release God to move more in our life, they'll change our lives. Number one is this today. Know that you're chosen. Somebody say, I'm chosen. Can I tell you today, accept it? Embrace it. Quit waiting on, a, on, a, on a drops of gold to fall on your head or whatever that is to make you feel special. Man, in Christ Jesus, you are chosen. Embrace that. Begin to think an awareness of it wherever you're at. Man, I'm chosen. It's a tough day, but I'm chosen. Don't like this spot right now, but I'm chosen. Walk in obedience. I know you're a good dude. I know you're a good old gal. I know you're special. I know that God loves you. But let's start trying to do what God's asking us to do. Let's start moving his direction. Number three, be courageous. Be courageous. Because honestly, it's not easy to follow God. I mean, it's blessed. It's awesome. There's nothing that compares, but it's not easy. There's a lot of stuff that tries to keep us from doing it. The enemy, the world, people in our life, our friends. And you know what I've discovered? I'm not there yet. I still have a, hopefully a lot of years left in this serving the Lord. But I'm going to tell you, in all the years that I have served, it never changes. We have to keep being courageous. The first time you ever say, I need the Lord, you have to have courage. The next time that God begins to deal with you about changing some stuff, it takes courage. When God asks you to step out in faith, it takes courage, man. I can remember the first time I came to an altar, man. The first time ever. I can remember, man, sitting back here, sweating, bubbling, nervous as a cat in or whatever, something in church. <laughs> Lord said, be courageous. And I came. I had no idea the first time he ever asked me to speak. Man, I'm sweating, I'm nervous, I'm throwing up, I'm sick at my stomach. And God said, be courageous. As I begin to, to, to go and be in churches and involved in community and all the stuff, man, it just keeps showing me every step of the way, being, being courageous. All this obedience, knowing that we're chosen and stepping in courage every time, every step of the ladder, man, coming to sweet water, people down trying to work. There's enough churches. And the Lord says, you're chosen. Be obedient. Be courageous. 
As we move into a new facility, be obedient, know you're chosen, be courageous. I'm just saying that at every juncture of the, of, of, of the process, man, this stuff is crucial. When we think we can't do it, the enemy lies to us all the time, all the time, man. I deal with this. Can I just be honest with you? You come and everybody's mad, nobody shows up, everybody's got their own ideas, and you're just like, what the heck, man? What am I even doing? What are we doing any good here? And the Lord says, you're chosen, be obedient, be courageous, and we have to choose. And so I'm just encouraging you, wherever you're at in this journey, what's God saying to you today? How do you need to respond? You're chosen. Obey what he says. Be courageous to act. That's what he told Joshua 1 9. Be strong and very courageous. For I'm with you wherever you go. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed when it doesn't look like you thought. Because I'm with you. You're chosen. Be obedient. Be courageous. Pray with me. Father, we love you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for loving us. And so, Lord, just wherever we're at, whatever we need to hear, God, I give you freedom. I release you to speak in this place to individuals. God, for some of us here that did struggle with identity, and we want to be there, and we want to fit in, and we want to know, but we just don't. And so right now in this moment, God, as we have our eyes shut and we have a picture of Jesus, God, that we would just understand that it's through Jesus that we see that we're chosen. When he hung upon that cross, if we didn't see it anywhere else, we see it hanging on that cross and the blood running down. And so for, for some of us, God, we would just embrace that right now. If you're here and you're just, honestly, you're struggling about being chosen, can you just, just raise your hand and say, I need Jesus right now. I need to know that I'm chosen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? You're chosen. Nobody else may tell you, but I'm telling you today that you're chosen in Christ Jesus. He died for you. He's forgiven you. He loves you. He's got a new place for you in the kingdom of God as a child of God. Lord, for some of us, we're here today, and, and we just we struggle with obedience, and, and we, we, we're saved, and, 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 and we know some stuff, but really... If we're honest, we're, we're just, we're not doing what you say to do. And we're doing some stuff, and we think it looks good, but God, I just pray, Father, that our heart would be to obey the Father's voice. Doesn't mean we have to do everything. Matter of fact, sometimes it lightens our load because it, it's not about doing all the stuff. It's just about doing what you say. And so, Lord, just give us a heart to be obedient in the little things. Obedient to love, obedient to greet, obedient to say hello, obedient to lift up someone in prayer, just obedient when no one else is watching. And God, I know as people, we all deal with some form of fear. Fear of stepping out, fear of stepping up, fear of trying again, fear of putting ourselves out there, fear of just being around. But Lord, let us be reminded as we leave this day because we're chosen that we can be courageous because you've already gone before us and you're going to walk with us and your spirit dwells inside of us and you're not going to leave us and you're not going to forsake us and no matter what comes against us and no matter what the odds are we can be courageous because you are our God and your right hand it strengthens us and it's not by might and it's not by power but it's by your presence in our life says the Lord and so Father I just pray that you would clothe us with a spirit of courageousness to live for you in obedience. God, we love you. I ask you to move in this place. If you just accepted the Lord today and you raised your hand for the first time, I would just encourage you to come and let's pray together what that means so that you take ownership of it for everybody else in any of these areas, obedience, courageousness. Seek the Lord. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Or just come. For yourself, Lord, we love you, we thank you, we ask you to touch and move even as we close, in Jesus' name.